speaker this afternoon is Dr. Robert Moore, who holds a Bachelor of Fine Arts from Syracuse University, plus a Master's and a PhD in History from Washington University in St. Louis. Dr. Moore worked for the National Park Service for 40 years, and from 1991 until 2020, was the historian at Gateway Arch National Park in St. Louis. His duties included the conservation of two nationally important structures, the Gateway Arch itself and the old courthouse. In addition, he was a compliance officer for regional national historic landmarks and consulted on preservation issues for such structures as the old cathedral, vertical log homes here in St. Genevieve, and a nationally important urban park landscape from the Victorian era, Tower Grove Park. And it was in that capacity that I had the privilege and pleasure of working with him for a number of years. He's published many articles, including on Lewis and Clark, Westward Expansion, Slavery, and Dred Scott. He's the author of eight books, and today he will present Courage and Cannonballs, a new look at the military aspects of the Battle of Fort San Carlos. Please welcome Dr. Bob Moore. Well, I can't possibly live up to any of that, but uh, <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting me down here this afternoon. And I think some people have already seen parts of this program. Because I had a little more time uh, today, I augmented the program I gave a few months back uh, with a little bit more information that you might find of interest. So hopefully there'll be something new for everybody who's here, and not just a few. Um, Feel free to come up with any questions that you might have as I'm going through. Basically, uh, what I'd like to try to accomplish is, first of all, to give my own perspective on uh, what I think was happening in the Battle of Fort San Carlos in uh, St. Louis in May of 1780, and then also talk a little bit about what some of the motivations might have been. Because that's the thing I've added here. Because one of the big questions I've always had is, how were the British able to recruit these many different Native American tribes to become part of this expedition to attack St. Louis? What was the motivating factor there? And I don't know if I'm completely right, uh, but from my research, I'm just going to give a suggestion of what might have been the motivation. So, as uh, the introduction was saying, I worked for the National Park Service for 40 years, and early in my career, I worked at several sites that uh, dealt with the American Revolutionary War. In fact, that's me 40 years ago <laughs> at Saratoga in New York. So a lot of my early experience was in Revolutionary War sites. And uh, a lot of the things I'll be talking about uh, firing a musket, shooting a cannon, I, I've actually done those things. So, it, at any rate, uh, I worked at Fort Stanwix, Saratoga, uh, and Yorktown, as well as Morristown, New Jersey. And the first three sites, we, we had a lot of discussion about artillery and what artillery can uh, do and could do at the time. So, as you'll see, part of my theories about the Battle of St. Louis have a lot to do with artillery. So I'd like to address why I feel that the Spanish-led troops in St. Louis, composed primarily of a French-speaking citizen's militia from both St. Louis and St. Genevieve, were able to defeat a far superior force of Native Americans in the Battle of St. Louis. And as I'm sure you know, the British Native American raid was planned by Patrick Sinclair, the Lieutenant Governor at Mishlamackinac, 
and assembled by Emmanuel Hesse, a traitor and former member of the British 60th Regiment. Sergeant Phillips of the 8th Regiment of Foot was promoted temporarily to lieutenant to serve as second in command to Hesse. Uh, how effective having these so-called British officers along, we don't know. A lot of the uh, thought process on how this battle came to be and what transpired during it has changed greatly since uh, the old days where we would think, oh, you know, we had to have these British officers leading these Native Americans because they really didn't know what they were doing and they needed to be led. And, and uh, of course, we're not thinking along those lines anymore. And we know that a lot of the Native leaders uh, were probably much more uh, in charge than the small number of British and French people who went along on the trek. The British, uh, by the way, loved three-pronged assaults for some reason, <laughs> um, which always seemed to fail, uh, as Burgoyne's <laughs> did in upstate New York in 1777. And as, and as you can see, the original British plan was for a three-pronged assault on the Illinois country in 1780. Early reports reached St. Louis that there were 300 British soldiers, uh, and it turns out they were actually French Canadians, and 900 Native Americans in the advancing party. In actuality, today we probably think there are about 750 Native Americans, and actually 24 traders and Hongaji in the force which was initially recruited to attack St. Louis. And they added to that total some 200 to 250 second box warriors who were very reluctant uh, to join because they were much further south in where they lived and were very worried about, well, if we lose the battle, we're not going to be in very good favor with the people in St. Louis anymore who were important uh, trading partners with them. So, on to what the motivations might have been. Why didn't the native allies of St. Louis, their trading partners, the Osages, come to their rescue? Why would French-speaking fur traders attack St. Louis on behalf of the British? And why would so many northern and midwestern tribes uh, become part of an expedition to reduce St. Louis? I'd say there were two major motivators for British allied Native Americans and French traders to attack St. Louis. First of all, the aid being given by St. Louis to the rebellious Americans. And secondly, infringements on the British fur trade by St. Louis traders. Most of my program today is going to focus on one man. And unfortunately, we don't even have a picture of what he looked like. His name was Fernando de Leyva, and he was the Lieutenant Governor of the Spanish province of Louisiana, uh, headquartered at St. Louis. The first uh, salient point to make is that de Leyva had been given orders by his superior, Governor Bernardo de Galvez in New Orleans, to gather information about the Americans and cooperate with them to harass the British wherever possible. Deleva not only embraced these orders, but exceeded them. When George Rogers Clark showed up on the doorstep of St. Louis at Cahokia in 1778, Deleva showed him every courtesy. He also eventually supplied Clark with food, clothing, and munitions. By 1780, Spain was at war with Britain which changed the situation from a covert to an open support by the St. Louis traders of the Virginians in Illinois. But I should be careful to mention that Spain might have been at war with Britain, but they were not allied with the United States. Uh, only France had an alliance with the United States, then and now. It's the only actual alliance the United States has ever made with a foreign country. And we weren't really the United States at the time. It was the continental 
Congress. But at any rate, uh, to go on. In addition to the open aid the labor was providing to the Americans, my research has led me to see an economic reason for the campaign of 1780, which provides a plausible rationale for all those tribes to participate. The tribes weren't interested in territorial conquest. And they had only a mild interest in whether it was the Spanish or the French who were in the Mississippi River Valley in terms of the very modest settlements that existed there. But what did concern them, and this fear was easily played up by their British trading partners, was the loss of profits due to reduced trade in a shrinking hinterland. And this is where the British and tribal interests aligned perfectly. After winning the French and Indian War and weathering the devastating effects of Pontiac's rebellion in 1763, the new treaties with the tribes seemed to herald a wide field of trade for the British in the Midwest and the Far West. By that time, the French had ventured as far west as the Mandan and Hidatsa villages in today's North Dakota, which was another major tribal center, a trading center, as was St. Louis historically. Going way back earlier today, we had a talk on the Mississippians and the Mount uh, City that once existed. And the continent-wide trade that had existed for thousands of years that had trade going on in what is the area of today's St. Louis. So these were huge trading centers and very important to keeping you know, the continent-wide trade going. Trade was also brisk with tribes closer to Montreal in the Mississippi and Ohio River Valleys in what's now the Western <coughs> United States. But these trading operations were taken over by the British in 1763 from the French, and they implemented very few changes in personnel. So you still had French-speaking traders working for the British fur companies and sending their furs and hides to Montreal. The fur trade of 1763 to 1721, or I mean 1821, sorry for getting the dates mixed up here. 1763 to 1821, different type of fur trade that came afterwards, was completely unlike that mountain man era which would follow. The tribes hunted the furs, the women of the individual tribes were the people who often processed them. The European or Euro native traders were middlemen who facilitated the trade of fine North American furs and deer hides for manufactured European trade goods. Each side profited from the exchanges, and the fur trade was the first major lucrative exploitation of America's inland natural resources. In 1764, the dreams of British allied traders were threatened when a new trading post was founded by French-speaking traders from New Orleans on the west bank of the Mississippi River, just below the confluence with Missouri. The purpose of this post was to forge trade alliances with the Missouri River tribes, particularly the Osages. But the founders of St. Louis didn't stop with the Missouri River tribes. They also encroached on the established trade with tribes south of the Great Lakes, run by the Montreal traders, who were now British or aligned with the British. Because St. Louis blocked British economic expansion to the west along the Missouri, and more importantly was stealing trade with tribes south of the Great Lakes, uh, Pierre Leclerc in St. Louis, his alliances and his settlement were seen as clear and present dangers to the economic interests of the British Crown. By 1766, two years after the founding of St. Louis, Lieutenant Alexander Fraser proposed that a colony of British citizens, military and civilian, be established on the Mississippi, opposite the mouth of the Missouri. This new colony, of the town or village would be a counterweight to the power and influence of St. Louis in the regional fur trade. 
Governor William Franklin of New Jersey, who was Benjamin Franklin's son, on July 10, 1766, put together a treatise entitled Reasons for Establishing a Colony in the Illinois. He wrote, if we have not a colony on the spot to support the posts we are now possessed of in that country, the French, who have a fort and an increasing settlement on the opposite shore of the Mississippi, will have it in their power by means of their influence with the Indians to intercept our supplies, interrupt our trade, and ultimately cut off all communication between the Illinois and the present English colony. At one point, Papa Benjamin Franklin said that he was willing to pledge financial support to this venture to create a colony at the confluence of the Mississippi and the Missouri. I suggest that the concept of that opportunity festered for 14 years until the stars came into alignment for Patrick Sinclair in Canada. There was an incentive for Britain's loyal native allies who would do the fighting <coughs> because their rival tribes would then be working under the same system of trade that they were, and access to markets and profits would be equalized. British officers, Captain Henry Perry Gordon, Lieutenant Thomas Hutchins, and Captain Philip Pittman were detailed at various times to visit St. Louis and make reports on it to Sir William Johnson, the British Superintendent of Indian Trade for the West, and General Thomas Gage, commander of British troops in North America. And their reports were sent back. And as you know, Hutchins made a very detailed map, uh, which could come in uh, great uh, uh, stead uh, and help uh, in terms of any type of planned uh, attack or invasion. Gordon wrote of his visit in August 1766, uh, his visit to St. Louis. At this place, Mr. Leclerc, the pr principal Indian trader, re resides, who takes so good measures that the whole trade of the Missouri, that of the Mississippi northward, and that of the nations near Levi, Lake Michigan, and St. Joseph's by the Illinois River, is entirely brought to him. He appears to be sensible, clever, and has been very well educated. He's very active and will give us some trouble before we get the parts of this trade that belong to us out of his hands. Even the small quantity of skins or furs that the Kaskaskias and Peorias, who are on our side, get by hunting is carried under our nose to Misere or Paint Court, <coughs> either St. Louis or St. Genevieve. Patrick Sinclair wrote in the spring of 1780 that the attackers should conquer and hold St. Louis to gain access to, quote, the rich fur trade of the Missouri River, and as retribution for, quote, the injuries done to the traders who formerly attempted to partake of it, and also for, again a quote, the large property they may expect in the place. So what were the motivations? not only to take the town of St. Louis, but to take it over and to continue to use it as a fur trading post, but in the interest of the British trade and their aligned uh, native allies. Sinclair appointed Emmanuel Hesse, who was a veteran of the British Army and now a trader, to be the commandant of St. Louis once the battle was won and the takeover was complete. The object of the battle wasn't to destroy St. Louis, but rather to change the political and economic regime to a British one that could continue, it was hoped, with the trading ventures to the Missouri River tribes that had been so lucrative for the St. Louisans and stop the poaching of tribal partners in the Midwest. And then there one last question I was asking about the native allies of St. Louis. Where were they? at the time that St. Louis was attacked. Well, their seasonal patterns dictated a spring planting in April, followed by the beginning of the summer buffalo hunt, which began in May, which lasted until August. So the Osage warriors, who could have given any other tribe pause in terms of a battle, 
were out on the plains of Kansas when the battle at St. Louis took place. By the spring of 1780, St. Louis was in great danger of attack and possible surrender. Lieutenant Governor Fernando de Leyva's resources were few. His reports mention only five cannon, two brass or bronze, six pounders, and three brass, four pounders. He had a garrison of only 15 soldiers and a drummer at St. Louis a corporal and six men at a broken down fort near the confluence of the Missouri and Mississippi rivers, and a lieutenant and 12 men at St. Genevieve. And this is a graphic representation of the Spanish soldiers who would have been in the middle of Mississippi River Valley back in 1780. And you see the St. Genevieve contingent on a row in the front, and then uh, the rank to the rear are the St. Louis soldiers, and then there was the small group that was at Fort Don Carlos, which was at the confluence of the Mississippi and Missouri rivers. For the defense of the town, Zuleva had to depend on the militia to augment his professional soldiers, composed of local civilian males between the ages of 14 and 50. The census of December 1779 listed 226 eligible males in St. Louis. Militia rolls listed 176 men and officers who were in the infantry company, which we see represented here. And then there was another group of 48 men, three sergeants and three officers, in a small cavalry unit that had been created by Deleba. We don't know that they actually ever got their red uniforms, which were described in the materials of the time period, but if they had, they would have looked, as they're depicted in this graphic, uh, this would have been what was called the cavalry unit, but they didn't fight on horseback. They fought as infantry uh, in the battle. To this number, uh, roughly 200 to 220 militia and 15 regulars were added a detachment of 60 militia and 12 regular Spanish soldiers who came up from St. Genevieve. Uh, the St. Genevieve contingent was led by Lieutenant Francisco Cardabona and militia lieutenants Charles Belay and Francois Belay II. And it was very lucky that uh, this group not only agreed to come up to St. Louis, but that they got there in time. Might cast some doubt on whether St. Louisans could have won the battle without this augmentation. So altogether, Deleva had about 280 militiamen and 27 regular soldiers to meet the approaching British force of nearly 1,000 men. In fact, Royal in Intendant Martin Navarro later reported from New Orleans that Deleva's total defending garrison on the day of the fight was 310 men. Now, Deleva was not a popular figure in St. Louis. He was disliked, in fact, by a very large share, if not to almost every resident of St. Louis. The problem may have been that he was far more liable to follow established laws and precedents than previous governors had been. So he was a man who liked red tape. He made himself even more disagreeable by insisting that citizens dig an entrenchment around the perimeter of the village and build a series of stone watchtowers in which artillery could be placed. It isn't known how much of this labor was accomplished by enslaved workers, but we have to assume much of it was. In fact, about a third of the village population was composed of enslaved persons at the time. It's important to look at these makeshift fortifications created in reaction to reports of an impending attack on the village. Uh, first of all, what did the tower look like that was uh, ordered by Deleva? Well, you're looking at a sketch made of the tower by Lewis Caleb Beck for a map which was engraved in 1822. The tower was torn down three years prior to that in 1819 but Beck, who drew the map, saw the tower before its demise and also platted the lines 
of the 1780 entrenchment around the town on uh, his map. So we're talking about a map made in the 1820s. St. Louis it doesn't bear any resemblance or little resemblance to what it looked like in the colonial period. But they're still putting the towers, and there's plural, because you can see another one here, but this was not built in 1780. This is our Fort San Carlos Tower up here. And then you can see the trenches. Actually, I think what he's trying to indicate here was a wall of logs, which was put up after the battle in 1781. But it went roughly along the same lines as where the entrenchments were at the time of the battle. So it's all being graphically represented uh, you know, 40 years after the battle is over on this map. So the Fort San Carlos Tower, from the sketches we have of it, looked much like traditional windmills in France, but particularly uh, some that still exist in Canada along the St. Lawrence River. Uh, one of them you can see here from Charles Peterson's book. And this is the uh, Choquet windmill, which may have been incorporated into this residence. So that picture of this windmill in the 1930s, I think today has been built into this house. Uh, here's a couple of other examples of other windmills. This one is um, in Montreal. But you, you see the, uh, the profile, the style of the windmill. That's where that particular windmill is located in Montreal right here. They Golf club in the airport. The so called Roy's Tower, seen here in a Thomas Easterly daguerreotype, was a windmill built in St. Louis in the 1790s on the shore of the Mississippi River, and for a time marked the northern boundary of the village of St. Louis. Later books often reprinted the image, either this one or an engraved version of it and confused it with Fort San Carlos. So you often see an image of this structure, which was call it Fort San Carlos, but it's, it's not. It was built as a windmill. So it was never a fortification. The actual Fort San Carlos that we're talking about in 1780 was unfinished at the time of the battle but apparently had platforms in place where De Leyva was able to position his five cannon. The tower was placed on the highest rise of land on a ridge overlooking the river valley, which survives today along 4th Street in downtown St. Louis. The land fell away west of this ridge, allowing the tower to command the surrounding terrain. And I don't know if uh, you're familiar with downtown St. Louis, but where the old courthouse sits today is on top of that same ridge. The Fort San Carlos Tower would have been a bit south of that, a block south of that, uh, but on that same ridge top. And then if you can imagine, if you go to the west side of the courthouse and you look toward uh, the Kinder Plaza Square, and you'll notice the land falls off there. Uh, the best way to envision it is if you're at a, uh, a railroad station, St. Louis Union Station, and you're coming toward the arch. And as you imagine looking at the arch, you're kind of looking you know, kind of upward at the courthouse and the buildings along the side as you're looking at the arch because you're, you're down in a swale at that point. So it was very wise to build the tower at this point. It's really the highest point of land on that first ridge line that was way up near the river. And I'll tell you why else it was important uh, that it was built on um, that particular uh, area as well. But first we want to look at uh, the entrenchments. So it wasn't just the tower, but they, the labor made St. Louisans very unhappy by making them dig these entrenchments around the entire town. And you can see how uh, extensive those were. That's a lot of soil to turn and throw up 
onto the side facing the enemy. But these trenches were later instrumental in saving the village when the attack came. I think the trenches were dug in a similar manner to the way they're shown in this period French engineering book. They were three feet deep, 12 feet wide, and three feet of soil from the trench was placed on the side facing the enemy to create a wall. So if we look at this profile <coughs> up here, this is what I'm talking about. So you get the trench, and then you get a double height wall by digging out three feet from here and putting it up here. And so you get you know, six feet of earth to be hidden behind. So very simple trench which some of these others are much more elaborate, but I just don't think they had time to uh, do that much work. So if they had enough time to dig, they may have put a firing step in, as seen in these entrenchments at Yorktown in Virginia. Strangely, Jaleva posted 20 of the Spanish soldiers, his most experienced troops, around the Spanish government house at the center of town, where the women and children had taken refuge. This may have been intended as a guard of last resort in case the Native Americans broke through the lines. The 13 remaining Spanish soldiers may have taken on the duties of artillerymen in the tower. The attackers uh, didn't expect to encounter trenches or a stone watchtower bristling with artillery. A splinter force attacked the American garrison across the river in Cahokia at the same time that the main force hit St. Louis. The assault made on St. Louis came from the north, parallel with the river, with several persons killed in the common fields on the outskirts of the village before the battle began. As the large force of Native Americans approached the entrenchments, they received musket fire from the cover of the trenches. But it was the artillery that kept them from attacking in numbers, and they lost any momentum their attack possessed when they were threatened with projectiles from the guns in the tower. As historian Wilson Prim, who interviewed survivors, stated, the Indians advanced slowly but steadily towards the town and began an irregular fire, which was answered with showers of grape shot from the artillery. So here we have a conjectural view of the battle looking to the southwest from near the point of the old courthouse. And you can see the tower here. So we're in part of the uh, entrenchment, and you see the tower over in the distance. Personally, I don't think the enemy ever got anywhere near, the, near that close to the line. And I'll tell you why in a minute. But the next slide's going to be this same view today. <laughs> so that places you where the battle took place. You know, that's what it looked like in 1780. And that's about where it is today. So now I'd like to tell you why I feel the militia won the battle at St. Louis. A six-pounder bronze field piece positioned in the Fort San Carlos Tower had a range of 1,200 yards with solid shot. This diagram, drawn to scale, shows how a cannon in the tower could place solid shot anywhere in the town or on the approaches to the town in any direction of the compass. That big round circle, that's the range of what it the Lagos Cannon from the shot tower in the Fort St. Carlos. And you can see that uh, here's the entrenchment. So the, the cannon with solid shot could cover anything in the, the town itself. Now the inner circle, that inner circle shows the range of grape shot fired from a six-pounder, which is 300 yards in radius from the tower. 
Visibility and field of fire from the tower gave the militia a real advantage. And here again we see the trenches, the tower, and that great shot range of 300 yards, which is much closer in than what they could, you know, they shot solid shots. And so I'll give you an idea of what all that means. The bronze guns they had may have looked like this. Despite appearances to an experienced artilleryman of that period, these pieces could be very accurate, especially at closer ranges. The weights of the gun tube varied slightly from gun to gun, and each gun was marked with its individual weight. The guns were lifted into the tower by a cannon gin, which was a simple tripod crane. Here we see the solid projectiles that these guns could fire. Exploding shot at this time period was used only in mortars and howitzers, so it wasn't used in the Battle of St. Louis. They had only cannon. A good gun crew, if in rapid fire mode, could put out three to four shots per minute with this type of uh, ammunition, and there were five guns. So three to four shots a minute, five guns. This is what grape shot looks like. It makes the cannon into a giant shotgun with the smaller iron balls flying in an expanding pattern as they leave the muzzle. This type of charge was devastating to attacking soldiers. Soldiers from St. Genevieve also brought a swivel gun with them. We don't know the size or caliber, but it was probably small. Nevertheless, this same sort of effect on a smaller scale could be inflicted on an enemy with a gun like this. We don't have evidence that it was in the tower, so perhaps it was placed along the northern trenches within the line of attack. The attackers also faced small arms fire, a type of infantry weapon that may have been issued by Galeva to his militia was this, the standard Spanish musket of the period. Note that its range was only 100 to 150 yards half the distance of what cannons could do with great shot. The attacking force would have been armed primarily with trade muskets, or perhaps some captured long rifles or military muskets. The effective range of these weapons wasn't much over 150 yards, unless they were rifled. In that case, about 300 yards. But in any case, the militia had cover in the trenches. The orange line demonstrates the effective firing range of smoothbore muskets of the period, about 150 yards. Note how this is well within the radius for the artillery and its great shot, shown in brown. Attackers would have had to approach closer to the trenches than the two figures shown in the picture to have their shots hit the enemy. The area west of the tower had been cleared of all trees it was relatively flat farmland sloping up toward the fort and the entrenchments on the ridge. So the militia had the advantage of the high ground, a field of fire with no obstructions or places for the enemy to hide, a position offering cover from enemy fire, and the looming stone tower with its accurate artillery pieces. It's no wonder that the attacking force, after five hours of finding no advantage was to be had, withdrew. Upon finding that the enemy possessed all of the advantages, they must have stayed well clear of the firepower unleashed against them, for they only lost three men killed, as far as we know. Instead of attacking the fortifications, they instead attacked people who were out working in the farm fields and picking strawberries. The soldiers inside the fortifications felt a sense of helplessness as, according to Deleva's report, Civilians were put to death and mutilated before their eyes. Dead villagers were found in their fields as far away as where Carr Square and Forest Park are today. Uh, and this also made St. Louis's resent Deleva. He would not allow them to leave the trenches and try to go out and rescue people uh, outside the trenches. So uh, there was really bad blood over that. Of course, if they had, they probably would have been captured and killed themselves. So the best wisdom, unfortunately, was to stay within the fortifications. 
Despite their brilliant defense of the town, the casualties outside the village were appalling. 18th century warfare was usually not this devastating to civilians. In 1780, about 700 people lived in St. Louis. In the battle of May 26, 22 of them were killed outright. <coughs> Seven were wounded, and the enemy captured 24 and took them away. This amounts to about 14% casualties. As a quick comparison, at Yorktown, Lord Cornwallis lost about 400 men as casualties out of his 8,000-man force during the siege. He had about 5% casualties after losing 400. And at that time, with 5% casualties, he felt it was fine, without any shame, to start to begin negotiations for surrender. Although ill at the time of the battle and needing to be transported from one place to another in a sedan chair, Fernando de Leyva did not abandon the watchtower uh, all during the battle. You probably know that he died uh, just a little over a month after the battle on June 28th of 1780. So he must not have been feeling very well uh, during the time of the battle itself. He was buried in front of the altar of the parish church next to his wife, who died the previous year. His two daughters ended up in a convent in Malaga, where they were supported by alms and charity. Without knowing of Deleva's demise, but having received news of the victory at St. Louis, the King of Spain granted a reward for the vigorous defense made by Captain Fernando Deleva, 45 years old, and the King promoted him to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. Lieutenant Francisco Carnabona, who was the commander at St. Genevieve, was promoted in that same letter by the king to the rank of captain. Royal Governor Bernardo de Galvez in New Orleans praised the valor and leadership of Charles Vallet and Francois Vallet II in the battle. There were many heroes on May 26, 1780, but I attribute the success of the battle to one very stubborn and disliked, even hated man, and that was Fernando de Leyva, because it was the stubbornness and tenacity that ensured that fortifications were built and the most strategic spot occupied by a tower that with its artillery probably won the battle for the French inhabitants. As a postscript, and I think I still have a little bit of time, uh, I quickly mentioned that uh, the story really didn't end with this battle, but there was a retaliatory raid made on the Sack and Fox. Uh, the poor, I feel so badly for the Sack and Fox uh, people because they were kind of pressed into being part of this whole thing really very reluctantly, and they were the ones that felt the, uh, the blows that were launched in uh, retaliation. On June 13, 1780, a group composed of 100 American troops and 100 Illinois farmers, probably deep Illinois, Missouri, and what's now the state of Illinois, under the command of Lieutenant Colonel John Montgomery, uh, made a, an attack on a Second Fox Village. They were accompanied by 100 French residents of St. Louis and 50 Peoria Indians. The second box retreated from what's today Rock Island, Illinois, before the arrival of the Franco-American force, but their abandoned village and their crops were burned. So that is really bad. Uh, you know, if you burn someone's crops, it means a starvation winter. And uh, that happened a lot uh, in the Revolutionary War period with Clinton Sullivan expedition in 1779 went into the western part of New York State, burned all the crops of the Iroquois nation, and uh, they all had to go to British fortifications to try to get food during the winter. All their, all their food had been uh, destroyed. The second box sent an emissary late in June to St. Louis to try to repair ruptured relations with their best trading partners. Spanish-controlled, French-speaking villages around St. Louis. As a peace offering, they returned three whites and three enslaved captives who had been taken prisoner on May 26. 
The seventh prisoner escaped from confinement and returned to St. Louis from the area of what is today Chicago. The punitive expedition led by Montgomery returned to St. Louis on July 4th. There was a second retaliatory raid that was launched in January of 1781. Reports had filtered through the wilderness that the British were planning another attack on St. Louis and were massing supplies at Fort St. Joseph, which was near modern Niles, Michigan. On January 2nd, right after the New Year's celebration, an expedition of 65 men from St. Louis, led by Spanish military officers, made a midwinter march overland to Fort St. Joseph. Aided by about 60 Milwaukee Native Americans, the Spanish-led expedition surprised and captured the fort on February 12th. Deep in enemy country and fearing a counterattack, they looted and burned Fort St. Joseph, then returned to St. Louis by March 6th of 1781, having marched a total of 800 miles across the frozen prairies. Today, the battle that took place at St. Louis is commemorated in several places, none of which are where the battle actually took place. So I suppose they're close. But, uh, so we'll take a look at each one of these where it's actually commemorated. But uh, one place is in the, the Arch Museum, and another place is our Wayside Market, which is actually along the entrenchment line. Another marker is fairly close to where the tower was. And then there's two older markers that are over here on Broadway at the hotel. Uh, so I'll show you what those look like. This is the exhibit we have under the arch about the battle. And in the Hilton Hotel, there's actually two markers there. There's one on so These are quite old, uh, the markers that are there. Uh, the one that's, it's on a, it's a rock that's in this area. I think that, that don't move around here, but you probably know, but I think it was um, early 1900s, I believe that one was from. But of course, it's at the wrong location. This is at Broadway, and uh, well, the, the tower was at Fort and all. Uh, and there's another one that was, uh, put up inside the hotel. We had that one in our collection. And uh, the, is it Daughters in American Revolution? Yeah, Daughters in American Revolution. They, they wanted it back. Uh, and then they were able to put it up here. Because it ended up in our collection. It was on a building um, in the area where the arch is today. And when they tore all the buildings down, it uh, was taken down. And so it was just put into our collection. It was in like the back room someplace. We actually had to get congressional authorization to get that out of our collections. I say our, I'm not even with the park service anymore, but out of the park service's hands. And this is the makeshift marker. I'm not sure if this is even still there. And I don't even know who put it up. Uh, but this is the one that's closest to the site of the tower. It's right by the parking garage uh, near the corner of Fourth and Walnut. That's right by Paul, Paul, Paul Park Village. Close to Paul Park Village. I believe that's put up by the Fernando de Libra and Spirit of St. Louis SAR chapter. Might be. I don't know. It's not marked that way. We had a stone when we were working on Paul Park Village, and then it got in the way of construction, so they took it down. Nobody knew where it went. I guess it's their tear down. Well, <laughs> could be. This, this, this is a marker made out of wood and it had a plexiglass uh, top on it to protect the yeah. paper insert that was in there. I'm not sure. We had, we had a stone and uh, a plaque, too. I don't know. It'd be nice to do something with it there. Uh, one time I suggested that, what if, what if you change the surface of the road where the tower was? So you put cobblestones in or something in a, a 30 foot diameter. Yeah. Um, so that it would be the size of the tower. Be commemorating the tower. Every time people rumbled their tires over there, they'd say, What's that there? and then there'd be a sign that says, You're now rumbling over Fort St. Carlos. And then people would know where it was. 
That's a close up of that. You know, Bob, that uh, sign's no longer there. It's gone now. It's it just appeared. I don't know what happened. Do you know who put it there? No. No, I just showed up there one day. Right. And it was there for about a year and then it disappeared. Yeah. <laughs> It's a nice, it's a nice time too. I mean, all the information's there. Right? It's, it's great. And it puts to the tower on the right intersection. Right. So here's here's where our wayside exhibit is. So we saw that picture earlier by the courthouse. There's no another one now. And uh, I'm not keeping time of, uh, track of time too well. How much longer should I? Talk? There's been artistic representations of the battle made at different points in time. This one's in the Missouri State Capitol by Oscar Burning House. And then in the old courthouse, we have one too that was done by Carl Weimar in 1862. And we had a restoration project for what are called the lunettes, with four large paintings that depict episodes in St. Louis history in the courthouse. And these were painted during the American Civil War. Uh, one shows the founding of St. Louis on the top, and then the one on the bottom is the Battle of St. Louis in 1780. Well, the conditions had gotten very, very bad over the course of time. And this is what that painting looked like up close when we started the restoration project of it. Uh, and they had to actually, first of all, they had to take off all of the paint that had been applied in the 1950s, the last time that it was restored, and then try to sort of painstakingly put back uh, what the missing parts of it are. If you ever tried to take a really old, dusty photograph and use uh, something, you know, like a, a computer program to get rid of all the dust and everything, that's what they had to do in real life with the painting. Uh, Carl Weimar, of course, being a very well-known artist of the American West, and several of his works are in uh, art museums across the country. This was a painting that's very similar to the lunette that was done by uh, Weimar's brother-in-law, August Becker, who apparently helped him with painting the lunettes in the courthouse. Here you can see Becker's painting, uh, an early sketch by Weimar of the painting, and then a, finished, a photo of the finished painting. So back to the attack on St. Louis, and we'll see a little bit of the progress that was made. You can barely see the figures or what's going on in this picture. Um, this is some technical information about exactly what treatment they applied to the painting. I know everything they did was reversible. So at some point in time, you know, 50 years from now, they decide we don't like what they did in 2012, they can actually take it off without disturbing the underlayer. So that's what that looks like. <laughs> And it's very detailed if you notice there. So a man here who's been killed and he's got a basket of strawberries. Oh. You can't even see these things from the uh, ground when you're in the courthouse. It's up too high. But it's pretty amazing, you know, when we got close to the pictures that on some of the Native American clothing and so forth, Weimar had painted every bead. I mean, you know, it's painstakingly carefully done, but something that people are never going to see because it's just too high up, too far away. You have to have field glasses. So here's kind of a before and after. Of course, he, you know, he historically puts in a walled fortification around the village. But he's basically showing the attack from the perspective of the attackers and uh, attacking people out in the fields. So that brings uh, my program to an end. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you very much for your.
your attention.